Hello, and welcome to Fresh Blood, a podcast about killing it in the age of ageism, where we prove that new blood does not necessarily equal young blood. Here to discuss what it takes to have continued success through life, I'll be your host, Jolie Downs. With over 20 years of executive recruiting experience, I've learned how much we can grow and be inspired by other people's stories. I'm excited to share that with you here on Fresh Blood. Today, we are talking with Dorothy Hewson, a licensed marriage and family therapist. Dorothy lived most of her adult life with complex post-traumatic disorder due to childhood trauma. The hidden chronic stress from her childhood developed into physical chronic illness decades later. It was then at the age of 48 and in therapy for the first time in her life that she discovered the truth of what had been holding her life back. Dorothy's own healing journey led her to become a trauma specialist, and today she has her own private practice in which she helps her clients dissolve their pain and live life fully. She has also recently published her first book, Transgenerational Trauma, My Journey from Surviving to Thriving. Dorothy, thank you so much for joining us on Fresh Blood. I am so interested to learn more about your story. Could you tell us a little bit more about your path getting to this point? Sure. Well, like you mentioned in uh, my intro, it started uh, much later in life. I'd I was already forty eight. I had grown children, and it, it was serendipitous. But my husband decided that he couldn't be an attorney anymore because of the stress. And I was very dependent on him at that time, which was a a symptom of having complex PTSD. I was very dependent on him. And so he was the leader of us as a team. And he said, we're going to become marriage and family therapists. And that'll take care of the stress of being an attorney and will both be able to contribute to the income and it'll take stress off of me. And that's how it all started. It started from just following my husband's lead, really, which is what I've done our whole lives. And it ended up leading you to something that has absolutely fulfilled you in ways that you never knew possible. Uh, I find that really interesting. Now, I also, you mentioned something uh, that about being dependent and Mm -hmm. how that's a a symptom of this PTSD, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that this is likely something that's affecting a large percentage of our population Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. without realizing it. Yeah. Without realizing it, it was because what trauma did for me and had an effect on me. And I think a, a lot of other people is it prevented me from developing emotionally and how we develop emotionally, normally, naturally, in our teen years to early adulthood is through finding our self fi- identification, our, our self, our own true selves. And mm-hmm. that that was completely mi- um, skipped in my life because of trauma. And so I was I developed the dependent personality disorder. And it shows up differently, but this lack of self-development is really at the core of how trauma affects us. How did, what led you to realizing this? It was a slow process of healing and it started with, I had to go into therapy in order to become a therapist. Mm. And, And on my first day of therapy, my therapist told me or diagnosed me, she said, you you have post-traumatic stress disorder. And that was the beginning. At first I resisted it because I was like, nah, no, nah, that happened so long ago. I don't see how it could affect me today. But deep down inside, I knew she was right. I, I knew it because I, I had been living with this these fears that I had internalized. My internal life was very different from what I portrayed externally. Externally, people thought of me as smart and peaceful, calm, self-assured, but I knew what my thoughts were and I knew what was going on inside of me and it was nothing what people thought I was. So when she said that, I it resonated with me. Oh, I can imagine. 
What was that like for you to go through this? It's I find that really interesting to go through the process of learning to become a therapist and then going through through the therapy itself and having those revelations that you're meant to bring forth in, in your clients. I would imagine this brought a lot of depth to your whole practice. It did. It really did. And in school, it was terrifying for me. I was terrified. I did not believe I could become a therapist. I was only doing it because I wanted to support my husband. And I figured he'd become a therapist and I'd just fade away into the background again. But when I had to go into therapy myself, I started with journaling because I couldn't talk about it at that point. I had pushed it down so far into just denial and that I I couldn't talk about it. So my therapist, she got me journaling. And that's, that's right. yeah, it was, I still journal to this day. It's a great way to get some of this stuff out of my body. And, and then I forgot your question originally. I think I, this is great, the journaling, because it's something that comes up often with, with people who talk about what they do to habits that help lead to their success. And they talk a lot about how it helps them lead to where they want to go in life and in different directions. And I think it's interesting that journaling also is very valuable in helping you evaluate what has happened in your life to move past various traumas. So this was a new way of using it that I've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it started with journaling. And then in school, I learned talk therapy, basic talk therapy. And I still wasn't able to gain the self-confidence in becoming a therapist. I was still terrified. And then eventually what happens is on the path to becoming a therapist, you have to start sitting with people and actually doing therapy. Mm -hmm. And it's under it's under all kinds of supervision and training. And the clients know I'm still learning. I'm in school. And I would get triggered constantly trying to talk to people about their problems because mm -hmm. I... It was bringing up all my trauma and I couldn't, I wasn't a very good trainee therapist there. You know, my clients would come and go pretty quickly because I just, I would freeze. They were learning. Yeah. I would imagine most people in the beginning of this process have to go through a number of those bumps to figure out the right way. But that's interesting that you're saying this, you, you would freeze. Yes, I would freeze and become triggered because they were looking to me to provide them help. They were, my clients are looking to me to give them something and I had nothing to give. I would just get scared. And what turned it all around for me was the mind-body therapy. Tell us a little bit about that. It's different from talk therapy. It's a technique that's, it's um, been developed to specifically treat trauma, childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I guide my clients, and this is what happened to me when I learned how to do it, was I was guided into my body to connect to my body and and different. I learned different breathing techniques. I learned different resources to connect to inside of myself. Mm -hmm. And and then my body healed itself, or I provided for myself that emotional connection and reassurance and protection that I didn't have. And so that's how mind, the mind-body therapies work. You don't talk about it. You go inward and you feel it in your body. And by doing this is what helped you build up that confidence that you needed to move forward in your therapy practice? Yeah, it, it was a life changing. It was, yeah, that's what changed it, turned it all around for me. And mm -hmm. it didn't take long. It was five days training mm -hmm. where I, each day I talk about it in my book, each day we would watch a demonstration of how to do it. And then we would practice on each other. We were all therapists training. Mm -hmm. And every day it was like, it was a, breakthrough, a huge breakthrough every day for me when I started connecting to that little six-year-old that had gone through that sexual abuse when I was six. I started connecting to her emotionally and providing for her that comfort that I didn't get. Yes. Yeah. I love that in your book throughout, you have 
the different practices that you used to help you throughout and with an outline of what to do. And I think that's incredibly helpful. And, and what you said is reminding me of a part in your book that you talk about reparenting yourself for past mm-hmm. trauma. I found that very powerful. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? It's so cool. It's a fantastic way to heal. It's a, it's, it's nothing new. It's taken from uh, many different types of mind body therapies, like inner family systems and comprehensive resource model, even EMDR, somatic experiencing. But what I teach my clients now is to go back through your body, you go in inward, you feel those sensations in your body, you bring up an image of yourself when you were little, and then your mind acts as the adult parent, and you provide that comfort, that protection, that help, that support your presence for your little inner child who experientially and in those memories, those procedural memories are in your body. And you can do it. It sounds magical almost, but it works because those memories, those experiential memories, when we were children, they're still in our body. And you can feel it now. If you just think about something that happened to you when you were a child, if you think about it and talk about it, you're going to, and then I'll just, I could just ask you, what are you feeling in your body right now? You'll feel it. You'll Mm -hmm. feel something in your body. What what do you suggest doing with that feeling? Breathing with it, describing it like, oh, it's a tightness in my stomach. I can and try and describe the nuances of the sensations. Oh, it's a tightness. Maybe it's a feels a little nausea. There's pressure that moves up and down. That and try and describe it. And um, what you're doing there is you're validating your emotions, your sensations. And then breathe through it, keep, stay with it, keep feeling it. And then what I would suggest is do different kinds of breathing exercises, but stay with those sensations and be the breathing, different breathing rhythms have a direct effect on your nervous system. Mm. So it's really powerful. So it's a lot of bringing awareness to it and, and essentially almost compassion with the breathing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like heart breathing, mm. sending love, compassion. Oh, I love uh, that. Yeah. It, I, I had an experience with the reparenting yourself, if you will, and, and doing that with that inner child. And it is a very powerful experience to go through. And it, it brings a lot of awareness to the different trauma that you may have had and how it started to affect your life that you may not have noticed. You can almost start to see the trail, if you will. It's great. That's fantastic. It's so enlightening, isn't it? That mm-hmm. you, it's, oh, that's why I'm scared of, of talking to people or that's why I, I never got really close to that person or it, your life just starts to make sense mm-hmm. in a way that you never really saw before. Yes. Yes. No. And you, so you talk about, as you're telling the story and in, in, in your book, you talk about how you had all these identities that were given to you and that you played out essentially throughout your life until you figured out that you had, that these identities were assigned and you had to figure out who you yourself were and you became yourself. I I found this really impactful because I, I think that a lot of people, I think this happens to a lot of people very easily without you realizing it and that we carry along the different doctrines that have been given to us. And a lot of times we do have to go through that moment. Could you tell us a little bit about what that was like for you and what you did to get there? It was like, I guess everything else, a slow process, but it was, it's, it started with just connecting to my body because my body is real. Like our our bodies live in the present. Our bodies hold our emotions and our memories. And so when I started developing a relationship and a time of spending with my body, feeling those sensations and connecting to being more comfortable in my body, then I gave myself permission to be comfortable with who I am. With the, and that's how those na- those masks fell away. It really started with connecting to accepting my body, 
being comfortable with my body. Cause like when I'd get scared or feel shame, mm-hmm. I'd have really bad sensations in my body. It's a horrible feeling in, in your yes. body. Um, really and you just, it really is. Mm-hmm. And I just want to get out of my body so bad. And then I'd have to put on masks in order to live my life in the world. I learned to put on masks in order to just, yeah, just be a normal person in society. (laughs) And what's it like for you now that you are so comfortable with yourself? Oh my goodness. It's, you know, I don't know if people can see it, but to me, it feels like night and day because Mm -hmm. I feel more congruent with what's inside of me and who I am in relationships and what I do and what I say. I feel like it matches now, whereas Mm -hmm. before it never really matched up and it felt, I felt disconnected from people and disconnected from the world. Mm -hmm. And now if I feel much uh, more comfortable and, um, happy. (laughs) (laughs) It's so much easier when you are able to accept yourself fully. It's so much easier to accept everyone else around you and and everything else. It just makes everything seem a little bit easier to me. Yeah, you're right. I'm much less judgmental. I was very judgmental of other people and very critical. And of course it all came from, I was critical and judgmental of myself. Mm -hmm. But now I find that I'm much more at ease with other people and their opinions and the way they live their lives. It's fine for as long as you don't hurt anybody. And I'm much more at ease and comfortable with other, with other people's opinions too, even in this era of political (laughs) divisiveness. (laughs) Of many opinions. (laughs) (laughs) So we've had an interesting life. I'd love to know, what do you consider, you know, one or two of your greatest successes in life? I would have to say letting, apologizing to my children and letting them and giving them the freedom to live their own lives, to live their true lives. Like Mm -hmm. not that I'm pushing them out or anything, but giving them the freedom to live their true lives. And I will be there for them, accept them, support them, love them always. But to give them that freedom, I think has been one of my successes that I would consider a success because I was very critical of them and judgmental of them up until I healed myself. And I I was a very fundamentalist um, Christian. And my son was, he told me he came out as an atheist when he was 14. And I just could not accept him. I couldn't accept him. And that must have been horrible for him. He's 14 and he needs his mom. Well, how did you, how did that remedy itself? Because it sounds like you have, you found that that golden place with your kids. And I think this is very relevant because I, as a parent of teenagers, <laughs> I'm going through a lot of those very difficult moments and, and a lot of feeling like, I just don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> so uh, what advice yeah. do you give people going, since you've gone through this, yeah. and you've learned from this, what advice would you give people, a parent-wise, that you think is something that would help them overall in in these parenting years? That's a huge, a big question. But for me, I, like I said, I, as I started to heal myself and started to provide for my own emotional needs, I was enlightened. I I was, my eyes were opened up to how I did not provide for my children's emotional needs when they were little. Mm. And so I just talked, started talking to them. They were adults. They were in their twenties, but when I started to heal, So I started to talk to them and and apologize. I'm learning now how I wasn't there for you. I was critical of you and I wasn't there for you emotionally. I would dissociate and be gone. And trying to help them understand what it was like for them growing up and then ensuring them that I I can handle it now. (laughs) I can be your mom now. I can, you can tell me when you're angry at me. I want you to tell me if you're angry at me, I can 
deal with it. I can handle it. I can be there for you. And, and that started a different relationship with them. And they began to trust that I could be there for them now. You brought awareness to your own traumas and how is it affecting you, which helped bring awareness to how it was affecting your children. And you opened up the dialogue about it. That's what you did. You talked to them and were open about your stories and your feelings. And that's a really big takeaway because that's yes. exactly what we should all be doing. Um, yeah, because the secrecy is what keeps that transgenerational trauma going on. And that's yeah. what I talked about in my book. If It's the secret keeping, those family secrets that perpetuates um, the cycle of trauma that keeps going. But if we can break this, and we can break the cycle once we start healing and start bringing out the reality of what happened, and it's nobody's fault. And I try to I try to bring that across in my book too, that I don't blame my parents. I, they loved me. They did the best they could for me. Of course, there's different. Uh, there's a different scenario when a parent is physically abusing, but that wasn't my, my case was more just emotional neglect. And the abuse came from outside of my family. Mm -hmm. But even then, uh, even when parents are physically abusing it, it's because they were physically abused. This stuff, it just keeps passing down until we start talking about it, healing and bringing out those patterns, talking about yeah. those patterns. Yeah. Bringing, yeah. Really noticing those cycles and figuring out how to start to bypass them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take the step to the right or to the left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, that's the power of healing yourself because that's all you have to do to bypass that trauma is heal yourself and mm -hmm. The, your healing will pass forward to your children naturally through the relationship of the parent-child relationship. Mm -hmm. It's really powerful. The The healing of yourself changed a lot for you, not only internally, but externally as well. And sounds, I know you mentioned in your book, the, you know, changing from uh, the community your, <clears throat> with your religion, if you will, and then taking a step out of that. What was that like for you? That was hard. It's really hard because, um, you know, that the Christian um, church was my family and my whole family, my brothers and sisters and parents, they're all Christian as well. So to leave them was really difficult. And it was, it took a while to learn to have, to get new friends, mm -hmm. but eventually I did. We have What's great now is we have the internet and we have meetups and we mm -hmm. have we can make friends across the globe, across the country. Isn't it so, amazing? Yeah, it's really yeah, great. It really is. And I think that happens often whenever people go through big changes within themselves, especially when it comes to really finding yourself, that so you do tend to outgrow certain groups or even friendships or changes seem to happen. And it can be very difficult. But if you're on the right path, I find that it leads you in the right direction. Yeah. And I was lucky because my husband also deconverted along with me. Or actually, he de deconverted before me and I just didn't know it. So it wasn't like we didn't have each other. Like we at least we had each other. Yeah. Yes. You know, you, you talk about, I wanted to jump back really quick because you were talking about triggers, being triggered. And I think this is a really big thing in life all over the place. Um, we all have our triggers. And whether you're, it's in parenting or even at work and someone triggers you, it, do you have a way of dealing with that so you can move through that moment in the best way possible? Yeah, the best thing you can do is is recognize your your triggers in order to recognize your triggers because it's in your body. Your your body's going into fight, flight, or freeze or faint. So you'd feel it in your body. You'd feel your whatever your go-to default, whether it's fight, you get aggressive, or you try and run away, or you freeze like I used. To become aware of it before there there needs to be like a pause in between your reaction and 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 how you can help yourself recover from the reaction it happens so fast so the best thing you can do is start to practice uh, mindful meditation mm. every day 
So that will develop a habit of you going inward and creating that pause. And once you create that pause, then you can start changing your reaction and calm yourself down when you're triggered in life. So I guess that preventative medicine is the best thing that you could do. Yeah. And I agree that the daily practice makes all the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Slip back into old habits and old ways. Yeah. What about, could you tell me about a time that you had a really big obstacle or failure or mistake and what you learned from it? I have mistakes. I do. I fail all the time. Just recently, I'm leading a course online Mm -hmm. and I had to, I didn't have to, but I was doing my slow, deep breathing, getting ready for the class. I had already prepared for it and I knew what I was going to teach on. And I had this idea that I was going to teach something better. If I could teach this, it would be even better and I could really wow my students And then the time slipped away and I couldn't quite prepare it properly. And I actually had a a panic attack. I started to have a panic attack and my whole body started uh, shaking. And this Mm -hmm. had happened before in the past. And it comes from a fear of being seen. And I knew all that. I was, I'm already a therapist, a trauma specialist mm-hmm. at this point. So I couldn't get my body to calm down. I tried the breathing. I, I had to get up and get a glass of water. And I tried walking around in the backyard. And I came back and I I muddled through the court, the class that I was teaching. And then afterwards, instead of falling into complete shame, I was able to recover. And what that looked like was as I went inward and I, and I thought about what was the mistake? Where, where did I go wrong? What, where did this all start? And it started in trying to please my, or trying to gain admiration. Mm -hmm. I wanted admiration from my students, Mm -hmm. from my class. And that wasn't why I'm doing this. I I had to talk to myself and ask myself, why are you doing this work? Why are you having these classes? I want to help people. I want to pass forward my healing and getting connected back to my why. Like Simon Sinek says, know your why. (laughs) Yeah, that helped me get to the source of my mistake. And so that's how I recovered from that. That. I, I find I've been using that myself and it does help a great deal because when you veer off your why, the different panicky feelings or what have you, the, the different negative feelings are able to penetrate. Whereas when you're sitting solid in your why, they don't matter. Yeah. They do what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah, that's that security, huh? That mm-hmm. you just, you're free. You're free yeah. from trying to please other people or wanting to be liked by other people and you're free to um, live your life from what you really, who you really are and just be who you are. Yeah. So So you've been, I say, I love talking to people who've been through a lot in life because you have a lot of wisdom. I'm curious what you feel, what do you feel is key to continued success throughout life? Hmm. Maybe at this point, connecting with other people mm-hmm. and passing forward my healing, connecting with other people who are still on that healing path, supporting each other, because we're social beings. And that's how that's how our brains develop. They develop from in childhood through the relationship with ourselves and our parents. Mm-hmm. And then how we continue on with that, that security. And, you know, when I reparented myself, I became um, my own parent. Yeah. <laughs> and so now just to continue on with it, I think to connect with other people who are on that same path and keep healing, keep going forward and healing. So important. It makes all the difference. Yeah. Those strong connections. Yeah. They can strong connections with yourself as well as with other people. It Mm -hmm. 
feeling whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious, what has brought the most peace for you in life? I guess I would say I would equate peace with being comfortable with who I am. I, I, I don't really think of my life now as peaceful. I used to strive for peace. That was really my my goal, you know, was to live a, a peaceful life and to give just to be a peaceful person. But I would say today my life isn't peaceful because it's there's more energy to it. Like my word of the year last year was self-discipline and self-discipline is to do something that feels uncomfortable. Mm, that's good. And I've been working on growing and growing involves failure and mm -hmm. making mistakes and that doesn't feel peaceful either. No. So I think, I don't know how to answer that question, but. You just gave me my favorite answer to this question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was perfect. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. <laughs> you're not growing when you're peaceful. It's very true. <laughs> what about specific habits? Have you adopted specific habits through, especially transferring a brand new career and, and finding success in, in this career? Is there anything that you do that you feel helps make you successful? Probably the biggest habit is uh, meditation. That's that I've I, I used to pray and read my Bible every day, so it wasn't too difficult to create a daily mindfulness meditation practice. I know a lot of people do struggle with, with meditation. For me, it, it wasn't that difficult, and I love it. I just I love the time that I spend with myself every day. It's usually in the morning, yeah. and a lot of times there's journaling involved. But that's that's the biggest, I think, difference uh, or I, I encourage all my clients, the first thing, you know, when they meet with me is start with one minute of deep breathing a day and build from there and do it to every day and make sure that you can succeed. You don't, don't start with 10 minutes because you're probably not going to succeed. Start really, keep that bar really low. Start with a minute a day. That's how important it is. I feel it's really important if you want to heal your trauma to start with just that one minute of meditation or soul deep breathing a day and you'll get there. That's the little baby steps. So we get there. Mm -hmm. I agree. It, it, it's a transformational practice and, yeah. and there's a lot of different ways to, to do meditation. I know people get very scared. They think I can't sit still and just breathe or I can't do this. And yes, anyone can meditate. There's lots of different ways to do it. And it is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I agree. There are a lot of different ways. I forget about that because I just like the, the formal way, but some people like to go for a daily walk and connect to nature. Some people like to, uh, I don't know, look at the sunset or ride their bike or there are different ways. There are a lot of different ways to meditate. You can, you can listen to a, a meditation that walks you through. It's a, that tells you exactly what to be brings your mind to where it should be, if you will. Yes, and yes. Prompts for you to, to reflect in different ways. So yes, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of different ways. So now, is there anything that you haven't done that you are looking to tackle in the next few years here? That's what I'm working on now is um, promoting my book and I'm working on a workbook to go with it. Great. I want to write my write about my parent, P-A-R-E-N-T, parent myself securely process or technique. Right. And I'd like to make it an adjunct book or to go along with my book mm -hmm. and keep growing my business, keep getting this message out to larger groups of people. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to your um, audience and just oh, very important advice, a lot of wisdom here. And you have an online program as well. Is that uh, is that similar to what we've been talking about or Yes, it yeah. is. It's parent myself securely and it's uh, four weeks and we meet twice a week and we watch videos on and we watch parents meeting the needs, the emotional needs of their children. Oh, wonderful. And then I teach my class how to take those concepts 
and parent themselves and learn how to meet your own emotional needs and grow yourself up securely or change your attachment style from insecure to secure, which I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Now, is that for parents of teenagers as well? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's for adults of all ages. You don't even have to have kids. (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. So I would love to include, is that included on your website then? Yes, it's on my website. Okay, mm-hmm. perfect. So I'll have your website link in the show notes for anyone who's interested in signing up for that. Yeah, that'd be great. That's wonderful. All right. I have really enjoyed this. I, everything you've said has been just very important and powerful. Is there anything before we go? Is there anything that you want to add or? Yeah, I would just um, encourage any anybody that's listening if you'd to talk to me, I'd love to talk to you. You can sign up for on my website for a call, a get acquainted call. And you don't have, you're never too old. You're never too old. I started healing in my fifties and I'm 60 now and it's been so worth it. I have, I'm excited to live the last third of my life and it's, it's, it's never too late. No, so, no, it's not too late. It's like stepping into the light when you've been standing in the shade your whole life and you didn't even realize it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd love to talk to anybody if they um, want to talk to me. Yes. That's fantastic. So <laughs> we'll have all those connections on there. Thank you so much for your time, Dorothy. I really enjoyed our talk and appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Julie, for having me. I really enjoyed it as well. I am so inspired by Dorothy's story. I think it's one many can identify with. It is so easy in life to go along with what is expected, defined by others' views and perspectives. Walking along, stuffing our feelings down, not feeling the emotions that bubble up, and continuing on whatever path we've been walking, blindly responding, I'm fine. No, really, I'm fine. Everything's fine. But so many of people out there really are not fine. They too have pushed those past traumas down, not dealing with it. And when you don't deal with it, that absolutely impacts your body and your psyche. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself middle-aged and thinking, what am I doing here? Who am I? Dorothy shared that for her, she was living in fear and denial and constantly portraying on the outside something that was much different than what was actually happening on the inside. I would bet that resonates with a lot of people. Now, Dorothy was able to uncover all those layers. She was able to find herself through therapy. She shares some of the methods that worked for her in her book and some of the processes here with us. Dorothy used journaling to help her get past traumas. I found this insightful and decided to try this tool for myself. It was incredibly powerful practice. By putting into writing a past trauma, I was able to finally really see how it not only affected me then, but how it has continued to impact me to this day. Bringing awareness to this, really sitting with it and evaluating that trauma, being able to see how I've grown around those scars was nothing less than illuminating. After going through this practice, I found I'm able to move forward more freely, letting go of the things that are no longer serving me. Dorothy also uses a daily mindful practice Mindful practice has been shown to have extreme benefits through life. Not only does it decrease stress and improve your overall general health, but it also decreases reactivity, increases your curiosity and tolerance, improves patience, self-acceptance, and enhances your relational qualities. All things that will greatly lead to increased success. Not to mention, it greatly decreases turnover and burnout in the workplace. Something for hiring managers to consider. Maybe a little mindful practice in your work environment. Simple mindful practices include paying attention, noticing what you're touching, what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you are smelling. Bringing yourself fully into that moment accepting yourself as you are and treating yourself 
as if you were a great friend, focusing on your breathing. As Dorothy suggests, start with a minute a day and go from there. But do make this a part of your daily practice and it will pay out dividends. Dorothy also used standard talk therapy, mind-body therapy, and reparenting techniques to help her get through her trauma. She now teaches her clients to do the same. She guides her clients into getting in touch with their bodies, connecting within themselves, and using breathing techniques to feel where that trauma shows up in the body. She then guides them through a reparenting technique, which I absolutely love. Everyone should try using this technique on themselves as much as possible. As a reminder, Dorothy suggests that you sit quietly with yourself, close your eyes, and bring up that image of when you were younger and you had a traumatic experience. Now go into that image and be a supporting presence for your inner child. Think about all the things that you wish had been said to you or done for you and give your younger self that comfort, that care and understanding. You will feel this in your body. Breathe with it. Describe it. Validate your emotions and sensations. Continue to breathe and soothe. You can also take a page out of the Havening Therapy while doing this reparenting process. And what that means is you can rub your hands up and down your arms in a very self-soothing way while you do this process. This will reduce the stress of thinking about a traumatic instance and it will produce relaxation. There are many breathing methods that can be used. Dorothy shares different versions in her book. I can share with you right now that a good breathing technique that will significantly relax your nervous system is to take a deep breath in through your nose for the count of five, hold your breath for the count of five, and then exhale through your mouth for the count of five. I love that for Dorothy, connecting with the body, the process of allowing herself to accept and become comfortable in her own body, gave her permission to be secure with who she was. In finding that acceptance within herself, she found she became less critical and less judgmental of others. This is really big. This is a universal truth. The most critical and judgmental people out there are actually those who hold the most criticism and judgment for themselves. When Dorothy freed herself, she was able to then give that freedom to her children to live their true lives and freely be who they need to be. And really give that freedom to everyone around her. If you find yourself often being judgmental, you might want to do an internal audit and see what's going on inside. My suggestion is that you just may need a little more personal self-kindness in your life. Dorothy also gave us a great example of the importance of knowing your why. When she veered off track from her why, the negative spiral of emotions found her. She ended up having a panic attack after less than stellar performance on her part. It's important to note that instead of beating yourself up or telling herself that she screwed it all up and fallen into despair, she instead went inward, thought about what is the mistake here? Where did this go wrong? And she was able to come to the realization that she was caring about the wrong things. She had gotten off course as to why she was doing this in the first place. When you are solid in your why, the negative emotions are not able to penetrate as easily because they don't matter. Only your why matters. And when you are embodying that why, you are free from the opinions of others and you are free to live as you are. Finally, I absolutely loved Dorothy's answer about peace. I completely agree with her on her description that the feeling of peace is of being comfortable with who you are. But as far as having a peaceful life, 
hers is one of energy. She is working on learning and bettering herself. She does things that make her feel uncomfortable to facilitate that growth. And growth involves failures and mistakes. And those decidedly are not peaceful, but they are vital to that personal development. So that is my wish for each of you to find that peace of acceptance within yourself and to create a life that is full of inspiring energy. Until next time. Thank you for spending time with us on Fresh Blood. If you love this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, or giving us a review. I'm looking forward to connecting with you again on the next episode.